Well, good afternoon, everyone. And many thanks to Evelyn Howard for the invitation to speak here. And also my sincere congratulations to the organizers for putting together such a beautiful program. I, I was immediately enthusiastic and immediately, immediately accepted the invitation to speak. But since then, I have also scratched my head a number of times because how do you tell in a simple but not patronizing way about analyzing a miniature? Uh, without immediately immediately wanting to investigate all the details. It turned out to be less easy to prepare than I initially thought. That, I, that is why I want to apologize in advance um, if I open too many do open doors. And uh, I take an example for, for, from last week's pre three presentations from which I've learned a lot myself. I'm trying to navigate through my PowerPoint, but it doesn't seem to work. Yes. Now you see the next slide, isn't it? But I want yes. to talk to you. OK, perfect. I want to talk to you today about three main topics. Um, iconic images, uh, compositions that were understood at a glance by medieval pe uh, pe people and that we still recognize today with little background knowledge. These compositions are common, but sometimes revealed through small, devi small deviations or discrepancies that they were made for a specific interest. And how do you detect those deviations and how do you interpret them it and how do you deal with it? And that is the first topic I want to talk about. Then I would like to talk uh, to you about more complex uh, compositions that don't come up very often, but that can be uh, interpreted by the text in the context of the book. I will not include the text in detail. That is not my specialization. I'm going to analyze um, the composition and check with you what knowledge we can already gain from it without reading, having read the text in detail. And finally, I want to talk to you uh, about the interaction between the miniatures and the decorated borders. In painting, we talk about speaking frames, that is, in a few cases where they have been preserved, provide fascinating storylines and interpretations. While I'm by no means an expert on border decorations and illuminations, I find it interesting to discuss why certain elements are not included in the main uh, miniature, but are included in the border, um, and to make a distinction between borders that are purely decorative and, addition, uh, and additions to it that might be meaningful. We are going to approach these compositions by studying a number of compositional elements, like the division of the picture plane, uh, use of space and perspective, use of color as well, sidelines, movements, light and shadow, and the role of details. It seems that still it's not really working. Let me just see if I can uh, easily go through uh, my slides. Because OK, so the iconic images. Um, this miniature comes from the Ceremoniali Blandinesi of uh, St. Peter's Abbey in Ghent, which was commissioned by Magellinus de Santo Bavone in 1322. It is a very rare book and offers a lot of insight in the tur into the liturgical customs and ceremonies of this, this abbey, such as those that accompany a novice entering a convent or taking his religious vows. Uh, the miniature I'm showing here now is sorry. It seems like sometimes I lose uh, the control and then I have to ask for the control again. So I'm not sure what it means, but I will go to the slide that I was here. Um, the miniature I'm showing here is the only full page miniature in this manuscript uh, and is divided in three parts. The most famous symbol of Christianity is, of course, the cross, which refers to the crucifixion. This image from the ceremonia, so Ceremoniali in of 1322, would therefore have been easy to interpret for any viewer. We see the crucified Jesus, blood flows from his hands, uh, feet and chest. His eyes are closed, so we know he died. He has a halo that shows his divine status. To his left are a man and a woman. The man supports the woman. We re recognize them as Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, the evangelist. 
According to the Bible, Bible, they were present at the crucifixion. On the right is a man with a large golden key and a book in his hand. This is St. Peter. He was not present at the crucifixion. When we look at the second part of the miniature, we see three women uh, with ointment bars, uh, jars <laughs> excuse me, in their hands standing at an empty grave. Two of them hold a, up a hand showing they are surprised. That's what I, this is the detail I mean. I hope you can see my pointer. Um, there is an angel sitting on the edge of the grave. He points to the grave and explains with open mouth, mouth what happened? Jesus was resurrected on the third day of his death. So this is all very common um, iconography, of course. In the lower register, we see sleeping soldiers in three niches. Uh, sorry, too quickly. Um, these are the soldiers who stood guard at the tomb of Jesus. They haven't noticed anything. We zoom out again, and the hole is framed by uh, a painted frame with four frickets at the corner, the angel of St. Matthew. Um, I have to change, I think, the way I present because I cannot, um, I made some small pop-ups in the PowerPoint and I, they don't come up. So I'm going out and I'm going to share in a different way. Uh, excuse me for the, for the trouble, but I think it would help a, bit, a little bit if I could present it in a different way. Um, here we are. And then I try. Okay. So, does this work? Um, no, we don't see your slides now. No. Uh, at no. least I don't. I'm sorry for everybody. And we actually practiced just before <laughs> starting. So it is a little bit uh, a pity that it doesn't work out the way we planned. And do you see a slide now? Yes, I think we see your screen with the presentation, the presentator's notes. Mm hmm. Does this work? Uh, no, still the presenter's view. Okay. Voila. No, still no. No. <laughs> <It was> like... <sighs> Sorry, people. Don't worry. Yeah. Doesn't go this way. I go back to the, and what do you see now? Uh, you, uh, a weird background and your slide. Okay. Uh, I go back to the original thing to hope that it works. But unfortunately, some of the things that pop up or had to pop up don't, will not pop up. But. En uh, privé weer gaan we nog instellen. Yes? Now it's okay, Evelyn? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I really apologize for this in internet, so it was not meant uh, that it went this way. So I, um, we were just talking about uh, the three soldiers uh, that were sleeping in the niches, and now we were going to talk about this, uh, this all figures in the, in the corners. Um, so that they are part of the paint frame. Um, of course, there is in the left corner, you see the angel, which refers to Matthew. Um, to the right, here we see the eagle by St. John. Here we see the lion by St. Mark. And here the bull by, um, for uh, Luke. So that's how the four evangelists, of course, and these are the symbols for, their, uh, for them. Um, because, of course, they all included this story in their Gospels. Um, it is very striking in this uh, presentation that, um, or representation, that 
that there is no depiction of that depth. The figures are depicted in depicted in an ornamented background, like you can see here. Uh, the crucifixion is repre represented in front of a dark blue background with golden tendrils, and the three women at the grave seem to be standing in front of a brick wall. The suggestion is made that the tomb is made of uh, a natural green stone. Together, they divide um, the miniature in three color blocks. Let me go back. So, blue block, a red block, and a sort of green block. Uh, what the artist does here is to abstract the background, which puts even more emphasis, emphasis on the main uh, image. These representations reflect the essence of Christianity. Jesus, the son of God, God dies at the, at the cross, thereby taking away the original sins. Through this uh, sacrifice, it does not stop at death, but it is possible for human guides to go to heaven. But that's not all. We zoom in again at the top miniature. I briefly mentioned the wounds of Jesus, the wounds of Jesus and the presence of Mary. These two are literally connected to each other in a special way, namely by a sword. As you can see here, the sorrows of Mary is a well-known theme in Marian iconography, which only uh, really became popular at the end of the 15th century. I show you two paintings. One by Bernard von Olli and one by oh, Vincent Matzeis, who show this, um, this iconography. Uh, and especially the, the sword, of course, that is piercing the heart. Um, this miniature is a very early example of, of this uh, iconography. Mary made unprecedented sacrifices by first giving birth to a son of whom she had known since early childhood that he would die as an offering to God in order to save all the humanity. Because it is the will of God, she bravely endures it. But that doesn't mean she is sad about but she isn't sad about it. The pain in combination with the acceptance in, is the essence of the seven sorrows of Mary. That is very literally depicted here by a sword that, sweet, that pierces through her heart, while on the other side it is connected to the physical wound of a wound <laughs> of Jesus. Mary therefore suffers along and is therefore an example for all believers. That he suf her suffering is mental is evidenced um, by the fact that there is no blood painted at the, uh, where her heart is pierced. The beautiful detail of the miniature is the hand of St. John the Evangelist, that is grasping Mary uh, while he supports her in this very difficult moment. Back to the right, St. Peter. Why is he pictured here when he was, according to the Bible, not present at the crucifixion? The key is literally in the key in his hand. That is a symbol of St. Peter as the founder of the institution of the church and the key, uh, key keeper to heaven. What is depicted here in this miniature is uh, the sacri sacrificial death and resurrection is the basis of Christianity, which is professed by a community within the Christian church. Peter played an essential role in this. From here we, all, here, we also briefly step into the right sheet of the composition, where a figure um, that strongly represent, resembles Peter is again depicted uh, standing behind a lectern. But the man behind the lectern is not Peter. There is a difference in the colors of the coat, coat pardon, uh, the wearing of the, the footwear and the hairstyle. This man is bald and this man is curly. But overall, the pose, the position of the feet, the direction of the gaze, at the suggestion that this figure is mirroring Peter. The girls of the man on the right have small horns. I hope you can see them from the PowerPoint which make that we have to identify this man as Moses, the important prophet of the, from the Old Testament. The tablets on the lectern, lectern are thus the Ten Amendments. Moses on the right uh, page is proclaiming the Ten Basic Rules, which all Christians need to, to follow. This is an important aspect of spread, spreading the faith within the institution of the church, mirroring Peter. If we then think back to the place for which this manuscript was, manuscript was made, St. Peter's Abbey in Ghent, where it was used for special liturgy, then all puzzle pieces come together. The clergy who read this manuscript venerate St. Peter as their patron saint. 
They also aspire to emulate Peter by becoming a, cl a clergyman. By this elimination, they are reminded of the important role they play within the religion. While in this elimination, thanks to the depiction of the brave Mary and Moses, they also get a direction on how to instruct the Christians. A detail in this elimination, are, uh, all details in this elimination are carefully chosen and support the main focus of this liturgical, liturgical book. This becomes even more clear, clear when we compare it briefly with this missal of the June Abbey, in which one of the captions also depicts a crucifixion. And I zoom in a little bit. Um, this crucifixion is basic, but nevertheless has totally different focus. Mary and John are present to the left, and to the right we see the three weeping women. women. Instead of this uh, of one cross, there are three crosses against the landscape, also depicting a thief and a murderer. One of them is dead, bleeding from several wounds of his boot, uh, wounds of his body and his with closed eyes. Yes, ma'am. Um, one looks alive eh, while looking up at the dead Christ. This man understood at the very last moment Jesus is the Son of God and was forgiven by Jesus for his sins. Since he benefits right away from the sacrifice Jesus made and dies at ease. This miniature focuses on our liturgical meaning of Good Friday, and it is all about the sacrifice of Jesus and the ability to forgive. I show you here the first folio of a manuscript, manuscript of which I will inform you um, about the details later on. With a composition like this, we are initially, initially somewhat lost. We recognize four groups on this thumbnail. Two times two men that are talking to each other. On the left in a niche, we see... And in the foreground, so we see you two men in a in a niche, and we see two men in the foreground. The last two men are accompanied by a page, uh, petting a dog, over here, from which we can deduce that the, this his master's conversation has been going on for a while. The third group consists of the word men, sorry, here, um, who are all busy on a construction site. And we see a lot of spectators um, between whom there is only limited interaction. Mm -hmm. Most onlookers have their eyes fixed on the people working high above uh, street level. That's here. Uh, if we look closely at them and analyze the tools in their hands, we see that they are not constructing. They are breaking down the building, which is confirmed by the large pile of stones on the ground under the scaffold. The house that was built entirely of stone, unlike the other houses um, that are partially have wooden facade, is being demolished. That is an exceptional situation. And above all, why is it so important to depict the demolition? of a building. I'll come back to this in a minute. I would like to talk a little about, about a little bit about the era or the scenery first. The composition created here combines three things. A vista, so here, a city view, and an activity that we clearly uh, must be clearly depicted so that you can see clearly what the, thing, the figures are doing. So this scene. The combination of these three is a great challenge for the artist. He has trouble getting to the uh, getting the composition right, and that can be seen in various aspe aspects. The artist dives into the image uh, surface vertically. Um, there we go. I hope you see it. There's a line over here in my in my slide, but I don't see it coming up. So, um, um, but we can see your pointer. So yes, maybe you can okay. point at it. Hmm. So 
the artist divides the image surface into vertically in two. So the, when we follow my arrow, you see what I mean. Um, the construction site can be seen on the right, the most important details of which are at height at the top of the illumination. So here. That this takes up almost half of the image is significance, the image area, the, the picture plane. So it must be important. The left part is def uh, def defined by a zigzagging wall that separates the uh, urban surroundings from nature. On the other side of the wall, there is a river that you can see meandering in. Uh, into this uh, into this landscape. The urban scenery also consists of a gate, a reasonable high tower, sorry, the gate the tower, four houses over here, and also uh, another church tower. These last five elements, so this corner are lit, they are little prepped cramped in, those are those really, those elements don't really get the space. It is also striking that the gate with the figures on the left is different in scale and color from the other figures and buildings. The men are talking and the hand gestures make it clear that they are discussing something. Those kind of gesture, uh, gestures make that clear. So all these aspects must have played an important role in the in the in the story uh, depicted here. But despite this analysis, I still had no clue what was depicted here before I delved into the story. Before um, go to do that, I would like to take a second miniature from the same manuscript in consideration. Now, this is uh, folio uh, one hundred thirty eight eight rectal. The miniature that opens the sixth book of this book. Um, this miniature is divided into a front plane, a middle plane, and a distance uh, view. The view is divided into a landscape and a scene in a, in a so the landscape is over here, and here you see the scene in, in. We start in the foreground, where we see seven people that are depicted. Four men and three women. What is eminent, immediately striking here is the static posture of the man on the left. Over here, oh, here, here, and the dynamic posture of the ladies. The man stands upright with stretched legs, showing no movement. Their hands gestures uh, are timid. Two of uh, the four men have their eyes, eyes fixed on a woman in white, crossing her ar their arms over the chest, so over here. The other two make a gesture in her direction. The, the women sink through their legs with downcast eyes, a movement that is uh, reinforced by the beautiful folds of their clothing. The woman uh, in red tries to catch the lady in white. The lady in green also turns towards, towards her. The lady in white is clearly the protagonist of this story. She has lowered her eyes and opened her mouth and, um, as if she were uttering, um, were uttering a cry. One arm hangs limply down while she holds her other hand in a fist in front of her stomach. It was Corné Miedema, an intern at Musea Brugge, who pointed out to me that the blood uh, is flowing from her abdomen. And if you look closely, you can see that she's holding a handle, which is very small, but you can see it here. It's a little yellow brownish um, dot. This lady has stepped herself. In a right line behind her, and even in the same color setting, white and red, we see um, we see a scene that is undoubtedly doubtedly because, uh, connected to this, because it is a very strong visual connection. An armed man pulls the sheet of a bed in which a naked woman sits uh, against a pillow. She covers her breast with her hands, and you can tell from her face that she is fe feeling uh, Threatens. The middle plan shows two old acquaintances, I would say, who we also have encountered in the previous miniature. They are the man in the red cloak and the man with the staff. On the right, a man, a man steps into the, perform, in the scene 
Oh, with the door, from a doorway. Compared to the previous composition, the artist knows better how to build up the composition uh, to bring a convincing storyline. But what is depicted? Naturally, in a miniature, a miniature as part of a book has an advantage in overcoming this problem. The text, of course, that's a luxury that rarely applies in painting. And if so, only is found out after a very long search in literary, literary sources. This miniature belongs to the fourth book of the Facta e Dicta Memoriabile, Memorabilia, a work written by Valerius Maximus that brings together a collection of memorable facts. Valerius Maximus wrote the book for em Emperor Tiberius around 30 AD. In uh, 1375, the book is translated into French and again joys wide circulation. The two stories that we just have discussed, um, we put them here next to each other. Um, they go like this. The man in blue, so I'm talking about the left image, in the foreground is Valerius Publicolo. Cola, excuse me, the first consul of the Roman Republic. Kingship had just been abolished after a series of wars. And uh, at the beginning of his consulship, he had a house built on the Philian Hill in Rome. From there, you have a good view of the city. Think of the Vista here in the, in the background. But more import importantly, the house is visible from all the all the corners of the city, as we can deduct from the miniature, because the building reaches as high as the two towers. Building the towers over here. Building this, this house on top of the hill led to the assumption among uh, the Romans that Valerius wanted to proclaim himself the new king, which is made clear by the miniaturist by all the people looking up at the building, and some of them discussing it. Valerius absolutely didn't want to become king. Therefore, he had, to, uh, had the house demolished in one night, which is depicted here, to make it clear that his ambition is not kingship. Valerius Publicola is the epitome um, of temperance in this act. He is the man in blue in the foreground, who takes the, white, uh, the, the time, a long time, as we have seen from the page, uh, to talk to a beggar. He is the man of the people, as his name, uh, last name also shows. This man and his act to demolish the building is the main focus of this elimination. The two figures on the left are Valerius Maximus in a red cloak and Emperor, T Emperor Tiberius, recognizable by his crown-like headgear and staff. They discuss the act of Valerius Publicola as a virtue. They are thus depicted slightly bigger and set apart from the other people in the miniature because they don't participate in the story. They reflect on the story. Knowing the story, this also contains partially, uh, explains partially why the artist had difficulties with building up the composition. The artist tried to find a way, now his way, with depicting a story that takes place um, in a specific environment, environment which is significant for the story in the history he is, de he is depicting, namely the top of the one of the Roman hills. By depicting the workmen on a high level and using towers for reference in height, the artist tries to re represent a high location of the house of Valerius Publicola, from which man and, um, had an overview over the city. But he cannot imagine what it looks like because he has never been in Rome or in any other city that was built upon and around hills. In fact, based on the miniature, you would not think that this make, um, maker has ever been outside Flanders because he does not have a visual representation of hilly landscape. To the right image, the central figure in the illumination is Lucretia. Lucretia is the wife of Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus, together with Valerius Publicola, one of the leaders of the Roman Revolution that led to the abolition um, of monarchy. Lucretia was raped by one of the king's sons, as seen in the background. 
The scene in the foreground shows how, after the king's son had left, she tells her father, her husband, and a friend of her husband's what had happened. She asked them to avenge her and then committed suicide with a knife that she had hidden in her clothes. With this, Lucretia eminently shows the virtue of Cassidy. The two men crossing their arms in front of their chest accept Lucretia's question, which is uh, actually a gesture from Christian biography. Um, the promise led to the war that eventually led to the abolition of the monarchy in Ro Rome. Although this event actually preceded the scene we have just discussed, it is not discussed by Valerius Maximus, uh, Maximus until the sixth book, book of the Facta Edicta. Valerius Maximum a, a, and Emperor Tiberius are thus also depicted in this composition. It is striking that they are directed towards each other and that Maximum, um, Maximus uh, even has his back to the main um, scene. For them, the conversation they have um, about this event is more important than watching the scene. That they are discussing the scene is apparent from Valerius' finger. I hope you can see it. It's a small detail, but he is pointing to what is happening in the foreground. These two figures, Valerius Publico, Cola and Lucretia, thus contain the essence of the book. It is not only an account of historical facts, but also the virtues that are associated with them. These virtues are stressed in the beautiful miniatures, but above all, they are worthy of a good conversation. This edi uh, edition of the Facta e Dicta, uh, Dicta Dicat Memor <laughs> Memorabilia was made for Jan Krabbe, abbot of the Duinen Abdij. I am very cu curious whether this was for his personal reflection or if he spoke about this with other clergymen in the monastery in Coxeil. I would think you would follow the example uh, of Valerius Maximus and Ep Emperor Tiberius. No doubt um, there are people in the audience who know more about this. I'd like to, like to hear more about this myself. Um, the next subject I would like to talk about is the speaking frames because uh, this is an, another peculiarity of manuscript eliminations. Um, those borders, um, they have many, many uh, examples. They are beautiful examples of borders filled with tendrils, flowers, insects, fable figures, and so on. And over the century, the border also um, has also become increasingly important and more realistic when it comes to depiction of nature. With some regularity, these edges also have a relationship with the main image and the text, or the text. Um, I want to touch upon that briefly now. For this, I have uh, a miniature, chosen a miniature that shows Boccaccio, who is uh, giving a book to, I zoom in a little bit, to um, Hugo the Fourth of Lusignano. They are, uh, the, the, the two are surrounded by courtiers and the performance or the scene is shown in a gallery decorated with various sculptures and a beautiful tiled floor. So the sculptures are in the top and the tiled floor is here below, of course. Through the opening in the gallery, we see different scenes that represent um, the copying of this text by Boccaccio into this book that is lays now virtually um, in front of us. The miniature is surrounded by a border decorated with vines, violets, um, uh, strawberries here in the bottom. The violets are a little bit uh, uh, in the top. Um, birds, a snail in, a, in the bottom here, and a beetle here. They are all depicted more or less in the same size. So the prop um, pro proportions are not realistic. To the right of the border is an armored soldier who attacks a dragon with a sword. All these figures that I just uh, um, summed up um, have no shadow and are rather two dimensional due to their poses and their linear depiction. And when we go back to the main um, scene, you see that the, the figures here have small shadows in Dutch, you would say a slagschaduw. So it's really a, a different way of depicting them. Um, the, the, the 
absence of shadow makes that it's, there's nearly no suggestion of depth, which gives them a very decorative appearance. This difference from the hillock uh, depicted at the bottom center, over which nine hairs hop around. I think they are hairs because they have black tips on their ears, black tails and stand high on their legs. This is somewhat contradicted by the corridors in which they uh, seem to crawl, because corridors are made by rabbits and hairs only make holes, no corridors to hide in. But the hare is an in, uh, indigenous uh, species and the rabbit was not introduced to a region until the Middle Ages, so I assume they are hares. Um, the hares are hide behind the hill, for example this one is really behind the hill. Um, they are digging holes or they are eating, like you see here or here. And it is striking that seven of nine hairs keep their eyes pricked up, while five of the hairs also look very alert. One of them even seems to be frowning. I'm sorry for making it a little bit <laughs> uh, human, but I really feel that this little hair is a, a typical way of looking. Um, The, the, that they are looking around very alert. It might be, a, is a characteristic of hairs, of course. Uh, they were, they were for, known for in the Middle Ages. Um, but this scene, which I have now described in a great detail, is flanked also by two coats of arms, the June Abbey and the uh, coat of arm of Jan Krabbe. This knowledge cast a different view on this hill, in my opinion. Uh, it, if it was made for the June Abbey, this landscape element could perhaps be a reference to the name of the Abbey. Then it is a June instead of a hill. Since those hairs hop around under the shield of arms of the June Abbey and of their abbots, um, may we then use these June inhabitants as a sort of mirror for the inhabitants of the Junes. The monks of the June Abbey, of course, I mean. Um, these hairs might even set a good example. Um, they are alert and will absorb what is happening around them, what is being said here, and will react or reflect on it. And that is exactly what also is expected of, this, of the monks. Um, I think that this, this is maybe far-fetched in um, what I put forward here, but I think that those kind of elements are most of all uh, used to make you think about it, then that is really one fixed uh, um, meaning that they want to put in it. Uh, but at least uh, I spend a, a, a little time to to think about what those hairs mean. And I think that's exactly what, what the artist said was intention was. To conclude, um, I would like to stress that the links uh, I have made in this presentation were based upon official interpretation, which lead, which lead to new questions, which needs research to be solved, which needs, needs research, sorry, to be solved. My aim was to show that while studying an unfamiliar representation, it is as much about the details, use of space, color and movement, sidelines as the outline, uh, as the layout of the picture plane. While when dealing with original compositions, you can assume that Every choice of the artist has been a conscious one, and one composition is full of choices by the artist and sometimes the clients. The miniaturists were no bunglers. They knew very well how to seduce and hold our eyes and how to make us think. It is up to us to find out what the underlying reasons for the choices were, what is the substantive message that prevails, or uh, the aesthetic one. And Thinking about the content, what specific part of the story was most important to stress. A composition, composition should be able to unfold by looking closely at it, so that every detail can give you new insights into the meaning of the image and the text. Slow reading and slow art are not new. These writers and artists knew all about it.